for registration. That's how the whole CEUs things works. Um, and two, off chance, if someone found somebody's wallet yesterday, somebody's looking for one. So if you have a wallet that's not yours, let us know, and we can give it to them. Um, uh, reminder, if uh, you need help, find someone with a red badge, and they will help you. Bathrooms are there. Bathrooms are all the way in the back. We got water spread throughout the entire building. Um, and please, when you have a chance today, go to the vendor area and show those guys some love. They make this whole event possible and good people, good products in there. So please, when you get a chance, go check everybody out. Um, cool. Well, our next presenter, presenters, um, we have, this is an interesting story between these two and they'll go into it a little bit deeper, but I've been around the strength world for a really long time. And I've always heard Tommy Moffat's name early, early, early on, and I've been able to meet him a number of times uh, over the years, and we've become friends. And if you know of Tommy, uh, I, I kind of jokingly call him Atlanta. So if you're in the South and you fly anywhere, you always have to like connect through Atlanta. And if you if you're in the South, the good chances if you have a job, it's because you've been under Tommy Moffat at some point. Um, he is one of the largest, we're talking about roots. He has one of the largest coaching trees, in my opinion, especially in this area. Uh, and especially with programs that win. Tommy's really good at winning. And one of his athletes early on, back to my era in college, was a big, scary, uh, quad heavy, giant armed elbow meat thrower named Aaron Osmus. So my first competition I ever had in college, I threw against Aaron. And I looked like a child, and Aaron was about 10 pounds less than he is right now. And I'm like, what in the world is that dude? And uh, he came to a home meet, and he whipped my butt left and right. And uh, we became competitors over the years, and he was one of those guys. It was always, he kind of went the shot route, kind of as in won the national championship. And I went the hammer route, but we both kind of met in the weight there, and we would have like this cool dueling thing, and it was like, ah, oh, Aaron's going to be there. But what I found later, we would, he was Tennessee, I was South Carolina, and we would sit there in the events that we didn't like, and we'd sit on the, the warm-up bench at conference, and we'd start talking training. This was like 18, 19 years old, like literally in the mid-90s. So there was always this respect of, wow, he's training like we're training, and he's training hard, and his Tennessee boys are training like the South Carolina boys, and we love this stuff. And then later find out the reason why he loves this stuff is because this gentleman is taking extra time and experimenting on Aaron and teaching Aaron and pouring into Aaron. Then Aaron, as I get into Sornex full time, Aaron becomes a strength coach. I'm like, hey, the shot putter guy came a strength coach. So we would see each other at conferences. And then we'd see each other. We'd go out for beers. We'd talk about training. We'd talk about life. We'd talk about throwing. And then Tommy Moffat's name keeps coming up. So finally, we start talking Aaron keeps telling me how much he's learned from Tommy Moffat over the years. And then in talking to Tommy one day, he goes, As you'd be amazed at what I've learned from Aaron. I'm like, mentor, mentee, mentor, mentee. And this is actually one of the main reasons that we came up with the strong roots idea. Because we realized the roots produce fruit, but those fruits re-fertilize the roots and it goes back and forth. So we thought there would be nothing better to have two gentlemen that have been instrumental in one another's lives in the coaching world get to talk. So Tommy Moffat and Aaron Osmus. Well, you're probably wondering how this is gonna work with two people at the same time and sharing microphones, but uh, everyone say, how are you gonna share this time? So I'm just gonna really open up and be honest with you. I'm just the hype coach for Tommy that, during this presentation, all right? I'm his juice coach, keep him going. He's a little older, you know, than me. We gotta have him going the whole time for this next hour, so he, they, this is a scam. I'm really not talking. I'm just his hype coach, all right? But anyway, let's start off and have some fun with you guys, all right? To get this guy going, let's start with a little bit of let's go from the crowd, all right? On three, here we go, one, two, three. Yeah. All right, all right, all right. Come on. Where's Come level on. three? Come on. Level three. Let's go. I mean, this guy, if we brought his trophies. They tried bullshit. Listen. They tried bullshit. Listen. If we brought his trophies, we'd need a wheelbarrow. Let's go. They drove all the way here from all, all parts of the land, 
All right, flew in. Was that enough juice for let's go? No. All right, we got one more shot. One, two, three. Let's go. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I have to say I'm truly humbled to be here. If you could see close enough, you'll notice that I'm, my body's covered with goosebumps right now uh, because of the opportunity to come speak to such a wonderful group of people. Uh, so uh, be what, before I start, I'd like to say thank you to Bert. I'd also like to thank uh, Pops or Richard as I know him. Uh, the first collegiate weight room that I worked in at the University of Tennessee was built by Sornex, and uh, it's left a lasting impression on me because of how sturdy the equipment was built and how it was all put together, and they did a phenomenal job. In fact, Aaron and I talked about that this morning. So what I want to talk about first is my roots, um, and I think we've probably all heard the cliche that you are the sum of the five people that you hang around the most. And the first time I heard that, I wanted to write down the five people that have probably been the most influential in my life growing up as a young man and a young coach. And I started with my father. Uh, my, father was, uh, um, my father was born in 1919 and grew up a bit of a strong man. Uh, he would uh, do chin-ups. He'd pinch grip chin-ups in our basement. He'd grab the rafters and do chin-ups and he would grab the, a pole that was in our garage and uh, stick his legs out parallel with the floor. And he would do, along with my brothers, they would do one-arm barbell clean and presses. And, you know, that stuck with me early as a child growing up. I had a big brother uh, that, was, uh, that was a competitive athlete. He was a collegiate baseball player. And, and back before baseball players were allowed to touch a dumbbell, he was lifting weights and and then I go to my high school wrestling coach, still to this day, the most influential coach that I ever had in my life. And then from that point on, I go to my college strength coach, Jack Williamson, my college football coach, Gary Darnell. Um, the first person that hired me as a strength coach is Coach J.T. Curtis in River Ridge, Louisiana. And he's won, five, I think, 586 or 590 football games as a coach, and he's won more uh, football games than any coach at any level in all of sports. And, and every time that I named an influential person, it was Johnny Parker, it was Coach Gail Hatch, and every one of those except for my father and my brothers, they were all coaches. And, and there are many of us here today are all coaches, and, and Luke, I'll never do as good a job of expressing how important it is as coaches that we do a good job with the young men and the young women that we coach on a daily basis. And so that's where my roots began. That's where my roots are. That's where the tree that I am is planted. And everything from that has gone into, you know, the great tradition that we've had at the different stops that I've made in my career. And one of the things that I've, one of the things uh, that rings so true to me all the time is that there are lessons in every experience and from every human being that I've ever come in contact with. And uh, my cell phone, the little notes app in my cell phone, it takes me sometimes days to find, you know, notes because the most current one is always at the top. And I'm constantly, you know, writing notes in that thing because of, all the learning that we do. Now, every opportunity, again, is some, you know, a, every experience is an opportunity to learn. Now, we'll all learn good things, and then there are some really bad things, really bad things. And there are some things that could be good or bad based on the situation for that particular day. And so, hopefully, today, I'm able to share some things with you along with Aaron uh, that, um, that you might be able to take back. All right, so let's get to the program. So uh, I was a collegiate football player for the worst college football team in America, and I was able to play. I had, you know, I got to play a little bit, so that makes me one of the worst college football players of all time. And the thing that helped me, uh, the thing that helped me a little bit, it didn't help me enough to be any good, but 
was the weight room. And uh, I knew early in my career um, that being strong and being physical and being fast uh, was going to help me to reach my goals. And, um, and as, a, as a kid growing up, the only reason that we really trained, honestly, was to be better at sports. Um, that was the sole purpose of it. And that's why I look like I look today it's because I don't train like I used to. Um, but when I took the job at John Curtis, that was my first job, and I spent six years there, and I was uh, a full-time strength coach. I never had to teach a class, and it was really advanced PE. So instead of the athletes in the school, both male and female, going to PE class, it was mandatory that they come in the weight room. So, and, and then I was an offensive line coach. I was the head wrestling coach. I was an assistant track coach in charge of sprints and some of the field events that I knew nothing about. And then I was a weightlifting coach. We had a weightlifting team. And it had a powerlifting team in years past, but they had never lifted weights. And because my collegiate strength coach was from Kansas City, Missouri, he was a competitive weightlifter when he was young. And so he taught us to snatch, clean, and jerk. And so when I got to Curtis, I thought that we, were, we had a very well-organized strength and conditioning program, but I didn't think we were very strong. You know, that we, we had, you know, they won, I think the year before I got there, they'd won their ninth state championship. And so they were obviously a very good football team, but when you looked at the numbers that we were putting up, I didn't think we were that strong. So I wanted to take our guys to a weightlifting meet so they could see some strong guys. So um, in the spring, right after wrestling season, Coach Hatch had a, um, a weightlifting meet, a high school. It was called the Louisiana State High School Weightlifting Meet. And so I took our team there. We got beat by 40 points from the second to last team that entered the meet. We got destroyed. We got humiliated. And our players were humbled on the ride back. And so um, I had a lot of work to do. And uh, so the next year we went and we won that state championship. And then we won ended up winning in six years. We won five state state championships. In the last two years, we took two teams. We had an A team and a B team, and we finished first and second. So I had a great mentor in Coach Gail Hatch. Now, he had a lot of kids that lifted on the other teams. He had teams that lifted for Catholic High and Parkview Baptist and East Ascension and teams from all over the state, Bird High School and et cetera, because they would travel with him to the junior nationals and out in Minnesota and stuff. And some of them were actually junior world team members. So there was some really good competition in that. So while trying to become a better weightlifting team, I spent a lot of time with Coach Hatch. And as a strength coach, he is my uh, single greatest mentor as a strength and conditioning coach. And he taught me what he would call the Hatch Method. And all it, it was a weightlifting program. So we continued doing that. Now, uh, moving forward, my first collegiate job was at the University of Tennessee. And when I interviewed for that position, they told me that in addition to helping with the football program, I was going to have to work with the track and field program and, uh, and be the head strength coach for the track team. So I was pretty fired up about that because I'd been a high school track and field coach and knew nothing. In fact, I knew so little about track and field that uh, the first fall I was there, I was working with the weasels. Those were our distance guys, and I called them the weasels. And um, so we were, they, were, they were complaining one afternoon about having to work out and then run a cross-country meet uh, the next day. And I told them, shut up, you're skinny. It doesn't matter. we got to get stronger. <laughs> All right, you look terrible. Um, and so, so we were training, and they were moaning and stuff. So on Sunday, we, in fact, we were, it was against Florida and Alabama, Mississippi State, big SEC meet. So on Sunday, I first I wake up, I get the paper out, and I look, and it said Florida 5, Alabama 4, Mississippi State 3, Tennessee 1. And I was like, we got our asses kicked. So I was pissed. So it'd be pissed because they were complaining about having to work. And then they go out and lay an egg like that. So when they came in the weight room on Monday, they were all laughing and cutting up. And I was like, what's so funny? We just got our ass kicked this weekend. And they were like, what are you talking about? I said, they, 
Florida scored five points. We scored one. <laughs> and they said, Coach, low score wins. So that's, that's my experience. <laughs> that's my experience as a track and field coach. That goes to show you how much I knew about track and field. But I knew one thing. I knew that you had to be strong and you had to be powerful. So Bill Webb was our head track and field coach. And so, uh, and he was also the, uh, the throws coach. He did the decathlon, decathlon, big time decathlon coach. And so um, he, he showed me, I thought I was going to go in and write the program for track and field. But that first year, he, ha- he already had it all written out for me. And he had, and it was well organized. He had programs for the throwers, programs for the jumpers, programs for the decathletes, programs for the sprinters. And it was a three-day-a-week program, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And um, so I, and he, be, he didn't give me an option. He said, here's our program. So I tried to negotiate a little bit with him, and he was like, no, this is our program. And we actually had words at one point because it, what it, it, when, when you looked at it, you know, at face value, it was what I call a power bodybuilding program. Coach, it there, sucked. It sucked. Yeah, okay. It was bad. Yeah. All right, so there's the man right there. It was terrible. It was terrible. So I'll, all right, so I'm going to put it out there. It was terrible. But that first year, I struggled through it. And we had, we had throwers that were more into, like, you know, they were the type of guys that they would look at the program, and so instead of squats, they'd do leg press. And instead of, you know, instead of bench, they'd do pec flies, you know, and things of that nature. And it was a power bodybuilding program. And, um, and our results on the track were not that good. Now, we had some other guys that were really good. We had some great vaulters. Lawrence Johnson won a national championship that year in pole vault. So we had some really, really good uh, field events, but we just weren't strong enough. So I kept negotiating with Coach Webb, and I never let it go. I kept negotiating, kept negotiating. He finally got tired, and he said, okay, I'll tell you what. I'm going to give you a couple of guys that I want you to experiment with, and you're going to have to prove to me that what you want to do is effective. And he said, I got this guy, Aaron Osmus. I said, Coach, I know Aaron. He, and so he said, you can do anything with Aaron you want. <laughs> and I was like, really? And he said, yeah, you can do anything with him that you want. And so you're looking at the product right here. He was my experiment. <laughs> and so I took everything that I had learned my entire career, and we put together a program. And it was basically uh, the Co- Coach Hatch's program, but I had to make some adjustments to it, of course, and if you want to, we'll put it up there. Now, this is actually one of my original working copies. I have it right here, and when you look at it, I mean, it's, you know, it's pretty basic, pretty fundamental. There's not any of the fancy um, uh, 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 event-specific exercises in it, like you know, we had, a, we had a discus guy that would get in a Roman chair and sit back and throw his discus for an hour into the net, and then that was his workout. And, but this right here was our first uh, experiment. And so we'll go over it for a second, and, and I know some of y'all probably can't see it, but Monday started with behind-the-neck split jerks. And then from there, we went to cleans, then power snatch, Snatch pulls and threes and threes. And threes and threes are going to be three snatch grip presses behind the neck and three overhead squats. And then on Tuesday, that was, and so what I did actually, so we changed because there was a lot of technique that I had to teach. And so Monday became a big technique day. And we broke it down into three position cleans, two position cleans, hang cleans, because we had, uh, and then I, only, I had Aaron and I had a couple of other guys too that started falling into the experiment. So we had to <laughs> teach a lot of technique. And then Tuesday was a tough day. So we'd start with four sets of back squats and then go four sets of front squats. And Aaron, so he took a look at it this morning. And as soon as he looked at it, he kind of jumped back kind of brought back some nightmares because the squat workout was 45 minutes long. It was 45 minutes of squatting. And uh, so he would always talk about week three. If you could get through week three, you were pretty good. In week three, we finished back squats 
with uh, six reps at 85%. And so, so Aaron, we, so we got out the calculator now. 97, we, his, uh, his squat max was 285 kilos. So 85% of that was 240 kilos for six. You know, he, that's a hefty squat. Okay, if you, all right, and then we, after that, we had four sets of five front squat, and so he would routinely front squat 200 kilos for five, and so we were talking about a rep day. We had a rep day one time. He did 500 for 10, and he did 400 for front squat for 10, so he back squatted 500 for 10, front squatted 400 for 10, so that's the thing that this program did more than anything was develop a tremendous base of strength. It was fundamental strength training. Yeah, so if you guys see me walking around, I'm limping a little bit, <laughs> grabbing stuff. Yeah. I mean, I was the guinea pig. Yeah. Okay. This is the aftermath. Yeah, the experiment. <laughs> so it was a tough program. So the first thing that Aaron and I did, we had to sit down. And, I, and so at the top of the page... My title here is The Things That Have Stood the Test of Time in Strength and Condition. So the first thing that we had to do was establish some goals. And that was going to be very important. You know, I don't think you can do anything in life without setting goals. And so the first time we sat down, I asked him, what's, your, what's the most important goal that you want to achieve? And he said, and here, here again is my track and field experience. He said, I want to throw 20 meters. Like 20 meters. I said, no, you want, you want to throw 70 feet. And he was coached, that is 20 meters. <laughs> so, you know, not the brightest candle in the box. All right, so we set goals. And, and you know, he shot for some lofty goals. And he, and he wanted to be a national champion. And so, you know, when you have a student that his first goal is to be a national champion, you know that you've got someone special that you're fixing to train, <clears throat> all right? The next thing is that I wanted to make sure that everything that we did was going to be fundamental and develop a base of strength and explosive power that was going to give him the opportunity to achieve those goals, and I knew that it wasn't going to be easy. And then the next thing was we, I had, the thing that I learned more than anything, because remember I told you every experience is an opportunity to learn, because as a high school strength coach, everything that I told those guys to do, they did, and they never asked questions. But the thing that I learned to do as a college strength coach and the thing that I learned to do most was working with Aaron was that I had to learn to listen because not everything, not every idea that I had as a young coach was always going to be the right thing for him to do. And so I really learned to listen him, and we developed a lot of trust because he wasn't a high school freshman or sophomore or junior. This guy was a grown man, and he was serious about his craft. The other thing that I learned from working with him was that he was committed to hard work. And, and Luke talked a lot about that in his presentation. You know, there's, you, can, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink it. Now, there are times when you want to grab him by the neck and shove their head down in the trough and make them take a sip, but they're not always going to do that unless there's a tremendous amount of trust and the guy has a tremendous work ethic and is not afraid to train heavy. And Luke touched on that also. You know, the guy that is going to back away from those, uh, a set of squats at 85%, 240 kilos, you know, it takes a special human being. And to be able to achieve the results that he wanted to do, that was something that he was going to have to do, and he wasn't afraid to do it. So, so for me, how I experienced this, uh, the, my coach was raising my ceiling, okay? We talked about the 20 meters and, 
and uh, 70 feet. I had uh, my notebook that I'd take to school to take all my notes in for classes. On the front, I'd take my time. I drew this beautiful 20 meter, 20M on my front of my book. And I had it in the weight room. And he said, what's this? And I said, it's 20 meters. He said, he said, I said, we're throwing 70 feet. He goes, get rid of that notebook. Go draw 70 feet on your other one. So I had to go to the bookstore, give me a new notebook, put 70 feet on the front of it. Yeah, but that's just, again, how we work. Um, something to also learn was he was very, if you, if you will accomplish this, we're going to accomplish that. And uh, some of the big things I remember was, was uh, the 120 snatch, 120-kilo uh, snatch, which is, I think, two, around 264 and that was something that I would miss continually in training. And uh, come in, I would come in from practice, and he'd say, you know, how'd you throw today? Oh, good. We're getting close to that 60-foot line, you know. And he goes, well, when you snatch 120, you're going to clear it. And, you know, sure enough, we'd be snatching heavy. I'd miss it again that day. But today, again, in training, you snatch 120. Sure enough, the next practice, you break a barrier. And he was really good to point you in that direction. Um, and then I look at, I look at this, uh, he talks about trust and faith, faith in your mentor. And, uh, you know, the, probably the craziest thing that, that happened in training was I got to go with the NCAA indoor uh, my first time ever. And uh, on Tuesday, we squat 600 pounds for a single. I throw on Friday night. Everybody in the weight room, staff, other people were like this. What is he doing? Why is he squatting him 600 pounds? And in 72 hours, he has the biggest meat of his life. Well, it all paid off because I won. So you start creating this trust, this loyalty, this faith in people when the product starts happening as promised. And that was a big way that our relationship grew so strong. And you're talking about the other athletes starting to trust this man when the things that were happening with me and they were seeing the product, seeing the training, seeing the hard work, and then they're seeing the result, there was a bunch of young throwers that weren't allowed to be on this experiment yet. They were going to the track coach, knocking on the door, like, can I please get on this training program? Because they were doing the three-day power, body power bodybuilding, and they were watching a little bit of an older guy, okay, come from a walk-on and win a national title. So they're pounding the track coach like, this is bullshit. I'm getting gypped here. Like, I need to be on this training. And they're like, in time, in time. So this is a great example of setting the goals, pointing you in the right direction. You know, you learn to do this, you're going to get this. And it, it was amazing how it all worked. So in watching Aaron and communicating and talking and trust, he would throw first and then he'd come to the gym. And every day I he came in, not just him, but all, but he, I'd ask him, how'd your day go? How'd you throw? How do you feel? So he comes in one day and he's frustrated. I said, Aaron, um, how'd you throw today? Coach, not good. I was all over the circle. Coach Webb says, my balance is off. I just, I don't have any balance. If I felt like my balance was better, I'd be able to throw. I keep falling off, etc. I don't know a lot about shot put, but I knew that we had a problem, and if balance was our issue, we had to work on our balance. So our head trainer was also a carpenter, and he liked building stuff. So I said, Rolo, can you build me a balance beam? He said, for what? I said, I want to work with some of the track guys. So he kind of, all right, and he went and built me a balance beam. So the next time Aaron came in the, in the weight room, said, hey, we got some extra stuff to do. What's that? So we got a balance beam. We're going to start doing some stuff on the balance beam. He said, why? I said, because you told me two days ago that your balance was bad. Let's improve our balance. So we started doing stuff on the balance beam. And again, there are opportunities to learn in everything that you do and every person that you meet. Every time there's something that you can learn. And so by listening and then taking that as a problem and then looking for a solution, we were able to improve his balance and, and how he performed in the circle because he was a spinner. And so he had, we had to improve upon that. And that was something that, that just by listening and paying attention that we were able to implement to help him even throw better. And that's, 
that's just a, one example of, of uh, a strength coach that really just stood up for you. And uh, something he didn't mention that uh, this guy built also was the creatine dispenser in the weight room. It's pretty neat. Uh, <laughs> is this, he'd load a whole bucket of creatine in it and it had this spinner, and you just put your cup under it, and he'd put, I don't know, five, five grams. milligrams. So, and it was at your uh, discretion of how many, you know, five grams you wanted to put in there. So... <laughs> It was, uh, it was pretty fun back then. Guys were getting really big, really fast. I don't know why. But uh, uh, Woodski would, yeah, Woodski would love that, right? Yeah. But uh, you talk about standing up for you. Um, I remember having like a wrist injury uh, that was this agon. Well, the worst thing as a shot putter is to have a bad throwing wrist. I promise you. That shot put puts a lot of stress on the wrist. And uh, I remember I was over there getting treatment. Just eye, stem, you know, massage, uh, physical therapy, all these things. Well, it was starting to kind of go on a little long here, and coach over here was getting a little frustrated. So we were really having to modify a lot of my training, especially the explosive work. Um, so we were finding different things with uh, some medicine ball training that if you want to talk to me in the parking lot about, I can tell you that that will literally put you on your knees, uh, some things. So I didn't want to have a bad wrist anymore because the alternate training was just crushing me because my cardio level as a shot putter was horrible. Well, this metabolic med, uh, med ball circuit was just my worst nightmare, okay? And I just wanted to go in and squat again and do things that were fun to be strong. <laughs> but after time, I'm talking about a strength coach that stands up for you. Um, I remember walking over into the training room, and he's following me. And I'm like, what the hell's going on? And he goes in, and he's like, hey, I mean, inside, training room, it's a quiet area, treatments are going on. He's like, why isn't this guy better? What are you doing? He's still hurt. Have you got an MRI? Have you done a scan? You know, it's been going on. What's going on? He challenged. He stand up. He would challenge other people in other departments, all right, to do their job better. And I'm sitting there going, this dude has my back. You know, he's making some shit controversial, all right, from a department. As you guys, strength coaches, know, athletic medicine and strength conditioning, it can go either really good or bad. And, uh, you know, I just remember them standing up and just calling them out. And uh, I don't know if you guys remember the Met, MetMax packets back in the day. I think they were, was it Champion Nutrition that made those? Yeah, Champion. So, you know, as a, as a shot putter, we weren't uh, allowed to get a lot of the supplements and things. Uh, you know, it was all reserved for football. And there was a back little closet in the back. And, uh, it, you know, Moffitt would give me the signal like, hey, go get your duffel bag. Go get your duffel bag. So that day I come to train, I'd, I'd bring the biggest duffel bag I would that day. You know, I'd go find one out of the closet. It was this big. You know, you could probably put 10 bowling balls in it if you wanted to. And uh, he would, like, look out, you know, make sure the fucking coast is clear here, you know. And then he'd grab it and just <laughs> run to the back and just stuff it full of protein. And then a creatine can the size of a coffee can yeah. and say, go, get out of here. Go, get out of here. And I'd go back, and I'm like, I don't even know how to take all this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, this was before Normatec and recovery boots and sleeves and things like that. So from this guy, you know, if I was tired, he would say, well, take more creatine, all right, and do it. <laughs> and, 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 and get an extra hour of sleep. And you know what? Wake up at 2 and take one of those Metrex packets and go right back, uh, Metrex packets and go right back to bed. Well, I ended up doing it, and... Uh, they say things worked out pretty well. Yeah, so I want to elaborate on the creatine machine. That we have. <laughs> so, you know, uh, and this was 1990-something in 1996. And so creatine, you know, was exploding. But if you, if you looked at an EAS can, because our, our budget was limited, and there were only a couple of companies that sell it. So I just got on the old, the early www.internet, I think it was Netscape, and I looked for creatine monohydrate. So I found a laboratory, and it was called Fun Style Laboratories in Waukegan, Illinois. They manufactured creatine. So I called him up, and I don't remember the guy's name, but I got a guy on the other end of the line, said, I want to buy some creatine. And uh, he said, how much? I said, I don't know. How do y'all sell it? He said, we sell it by the 55-gallon drum. He said, I'll take it. <laughs> and we paid like two cents a gram for 
hundreds and hundreds of pounds. So what are you going to do with all this grid? They said, so we're fixing to get big. <laughs> and so I went to the head trainer. I said, Rolo, because we were spooning it out. You know, it takes a long time to spool out 55 gallons of grid. So I said, we need a way to dispense this for the athletes so that it, you know, we're not sticking our hand in the bag all the time. So he took a piece of PVC pipe that was about this big. And he took two cylinders, one had a hole in it in one place, it, was, it stayed stationary, and then the other one would spin around. And he kept drilling out the hole until he made a hole that was equal to five grams of creatine. So the players, athletes, would walk over there to the machine and dispense it. So if you were 200 pounds or under, you got one drop. If you were... 200 pounds or over, you got two drops, and some guys got three. <laughs> and so that's how we dispensed it. And so uh, we did. We got jacked. And that was... <laughs> so when Derek was talking about, you know, the initial response was, Whoo! all right, we had a lot of that. <laughs> and uh, our football team, you know, they, um, they benefited from as well. So, you know, I was the assistant strength coach, and... Uh, our football strength program was a lot like our track and field program. It was power bodybuilding. It would be four sets of cleans, bench, pec flies, tries and buys, and you were done. And so, and I, while I was negotiating with the track coach, I was also negotiating with the head strength coach for football. And so we had to keep buying weights because when we first got there, or when I first got there, uh, the more snatches and cleans and jerks that I programmed, our weights started falling apart because they'd had bumpers. They were probably five years old. I don't, they were USA bumpers, as a matter of fact. I don't know if any old guys in here remember USA bumpers, but we had 45-pound bumpers. They were orange. We had 25, no, 35-pound bumpers. They were blue. And we had 25-pound bumpers, and they were white. And we started using them, and they started falling apart. And so I told Coach Stuckey, I said, Coach, we got to buy some Alicos. They're going to last a lot. We actually had Alico bars, but we didn't have Alico plates. So we started buying Alicos, and we started buying 20 kilos. We bought 20 and 10 kilogram plates. So the stronger Aaron got, it got to the point where, you know, you can't put 600 pounds on the bar with 20 kilogram plates. So I don't know how many of y'all know Bud Sharniga, but Bud owned Dynamic Fitness, and at the time, Bud was the only guy that you could buy Alico plates from. So I called Bud. I said, Bud, I need four 25-kilogram plates. And he was like, and Bud, if you know Bud, he was like, you dumbass, why didn't you order those before? I tried to get you to. I said, well, I'm sorry, Bud. Can you please, he was like the soup Nazi. I said, can you please, <laughs> forgive me, Bud, but I said, can you please sell me four 25-kilogram bumpers? Absolutely. So he sent them. So we started squatting, and then I needed more. Couldn't put enough weight on the bar for double A. So I called Bud up again. I said, Bud, I need four 25-kilogram bumpers. He goes, why didn't you buy those the last time? And I said, I'm sorry, Bud. Will you please send me four 25-kilogram bumpers? Absolutely. So months roll around. We can't put enough weight on the bar. So I called Bud. I said, Bud, I need four 25 kilogram bumpers. He's like, what the hell are you doing? Who is this guy? I said, I, uh, you're going to find out. All right, so just wait. And so, you know, everything got better. So Coach Stuckey kept seeing these squats, and he kept seeing the growth. And he not only saw the growth in AA, but he started seeing the growth in some of these young throwers that we had. And so Coach Stuckey started hanging out. So the track team would start coming in around 2.30 in the afternoon, 2, 2.30 in the afternoon. The throws would come first, and then the jumpers would come, and then the sprinters would come, and then the decathletes would come. So Coach Stuckey, before going out to football practice, he would stand on the counter. He would lean on the counter like this beside the creatine dispenser, and he'd watch him train. So then he started asking questions. What's going on? What are you doing? Let me see that workout. And he would sit there, and he, he'd take this workout. He would study it and go over it and look. And then before long, he goes, hey, buddy. He said, I want you to experiment with a group of players. Uh, I like what you're doing, and I want to see. And he spoke real quiet, real soft. He said, I want to see you 
take a group of football players, put them on the same program that Aaron is doing, and let's see what happens. So then that fall, uh, we took a developmental squad group of players, and we put them on the program, and it was the experiment continued. So what we started doing was we'd take this program, and you can see the adjustments that, you know, because I was, you know, learning as I went, and I kept making adjustments to the program. So I took that program that Aaron did in 96, and that fall in 97, the football players did the program. And then that offseason, Aaron was doing something very similar but still different. And then that spring, I made adjustments to it. I mean, that winter, after Coach Stuckey saw what we did with the developmental squad, he said, okay, I want you to take that program, and this will be the first time that I haven't written a program for the offseason, and I want you to do it with the football team. <laughs> so then that offseason, we had guys like Peyton Manning and, you know, guys that played years and years and years in the NFL that were training like Aaron. And so now when I have a quarterback say, Coach, I can't, I can't do this, I can't do that, I still have Peyton Manning's workout, and I pull it out of my desk drawer, and I said, take that back to the dorm room, read it, and come back and tell me what you're going to do and what you're not going to do. Because if Peyton Manning could do it, anybody can do it. Because he was the worst athlete on the team at the time. <laughs> <laughs> All right? And so... The, the program continued to grow and improve and grow. And, you know, when I reached into the, to the uh, book, I pulled, I thought I was grabbing the 97 program, but I didn't. I grabbed the 1996 program. But it all continued to evolve. And then before long, it turned into the University of Tennessee Strength and Conditioning Program for football. Now, they couldn't handle the third day on, on Wednesday. So Wednesday was a big technique day. Uh, for us where we, you know, we did a lot of hang snatch, hang cleans, behind the neck push jerks. We did some single leg squats, some RDLs, et cetera. The football players couldn't handle that. So what we did, we took it, and Monday was just like this Monday here. Tuesday was just like this Tuesday here. We took Friday, which was what we called Brutal Friday, where we did segment training where you'd go up to a 1RM and clean and then go down, go back up to one RM and clean, go back down and do it again sometimes. We'd do three of those and then we'd go to snatch and go up to a single and go back down and go up to a single and go back down. And so football players couldn't handle that either because of all the running that you have to do. You know, you could tell he was an endurance athlete. Mm -hmm. All right, so two different body types, two different type of athletes, but the football players, so I took that Friday workout that he did, I moved it to Thursday, I took the Thursday workout that he did and moved that to Friday. And then that's been really very, I mean, very similar to what we're still doing today at LSU. Now, it changed. After I left Tennessee, I went to Miami. And uh, the strength coach before me at Miami was a high-intensity, one-set-to-failure strength coach. And so I knew immediately the first day. So you know it's going to be a bad day. So uh, Monday was Martin Luther King Day. Tuesday was our first day as a strength coach. My first day as a strength coach with the University of Miami football team. And it's our squat day. You can look up there Tuesday, back squat, front squat. So I sit there and I got it all written out on a white marker board. I go over the workout. I said, all right, let's go squat. And I went over toward the squat rack and nobody was there. And I turned around. I had five guys on the leg press, five guys on leg extension, five guys on a Smith machine. I'm like, what the heck's good guys? I blow my whistle. Come back over here. I said, today is squat day. So I learned quick that those guys weren't accustomed to squatting, so I had to make some changes then, you know, because, again, every situation is an opportunity to learn, and through the years, this program has evolved and evolved and evolved. Yeah, which, which puts, it, this is the point where it puts me in, in as a coach. So uh, Tommy had left to go to Miami. I finished my senior year in track, and uh, John Stuckey approaches me. Uh, I think I was graduating in August. This was probably... This is probably July. I'm just sitting there playing around summer. Uh, my track season was done. My eligibility was done. I was just sitting there to continue, continuing to lift. And uh, Stucky walks over to me and, like, taps me on the shoulder. And, of course, you know, hey, buddy, what you doing? You know, and uh, ah, just lifting coach. And he's like, uh, when do you graduate? And I said, I think it's August 15th, whatever. And he said, 
He said, well, I'm going to admin today, and if you will accept, I'm going to ask for a third GA. He goes, we have two, but I'm going to ask for a third one, only if you'll say yes. So I looked at him, and I was like, coach? You know, me? You know? I said, how am I going to coach? I've never coached. And he was kind of like, well, you, you lived through the program. You made it. <laughs> and uh, it, it's going to come to you. So it, for me, it was like, oh, okay, because I did the program. I can coach the program. Great. All right, I accept the job. You know? And I had to learn real quick. You know, I had to learn how to coach. And I had to learn just because I went through the program and I knew how to do technique of all these lifts. All right, it doesn't automatically allow me to coach it. So I had it right there. That was my pivotal moment, all right, to learn how to start coaching. And I remember it was, it was right away, like the first day I was coaching like two guys. I had to learn how to coach two guys well, all right? And there's other coaches that were coaching 10, 12, 14 guys at a time. They got four here, four there, two over there, and they're just like running it like a Harley-Davidson factory. It was like a machine, okay? And I'm sitting here like I'm struggling coaching two guys. But you start learning, like, how do I expand? How do I get to where I get to take more athletes under my belt and coach? And that just comes with time. And you had to learn to get good at it. And I, you know, Big Tony over there is a big, big guy, big time cook. But I think it's a lot like cooking, okay? You first, probably first thing you ever cook is probably some scrambled eggs, all right? And you're excited about to cook some scrambled eggs, probably screw it up the first couple times, overcook them or whatever, stick to the pan. You know, and next thing you know, you can cook eggs here and they got bacon over here and you shove some biscuits in the oven. And now you're managing three things at one time. You're learning to cook, all right? Then you might mistime it where the, the eggs are ready, the bacon's, you just overcooked it, and then you burnt the biscuits because you weren't paying attention to all the things happening at one time. But you soon learn to master cooking. You learn to where you can throw a, a meal out, the eggs are hot and steamy, they're ready, the biscuits are perfect, and the bacon's just like everybody likes it. But that takes time. And I think coaching is very similar uh, to expand and do it, you just have to keep practicing and broaden your perspective. So for me, that was my jump in as a GA at Tennessee. Well, he had just left to go to Miami. Well, I don't know if you remember 98, but Tennessee went, wins the national title. All right, they should have shipped him down a ring because he just missed the boat uh, of the opportunity. So I come in as a GA, and my first semester, we win a national title. And I go in the office when we get back, and we're like, move, we're national champs. And Stucky sits down at the front of the desk. We're about to play in the offseason. This man has been in the profession for, for years, decades. It was his first one. And he tried to humble us young, peop us young coaches of, like, what just happened is special, okay? And don't just think, you know, this is going to always happen. And, and, and I'm glad you got to be a part of it, but, guys, cherish this. This is a big deal. So he kind of brought us back down to earth because as a young coach, I don't know, I was 23, 24, you know, you go in, you have a national title ring your first time accepting a coaching role and putting a whistle around your neck. You just think this stuff's going to roll in the rest of your life, and it doesn't. So that, 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 was my, uh, that was my coming into coaching, having to really learn a lot, but it was obviously worth it. So after two years at Miami, and the program evolving, uh, totally different athlete. Uh, creatine was monitored now. <laughs> so the recovery wasn't the same, completely different type of athlete. I had to evolve. So looking at the program, talking to Coach Hatch, calling around, you know, talking to other people, I switched from a four-day-a-week program to a three-day-a-week program. So I took Monday and Tuesday, combined those two days. I took Wednesday, uh, changed it just a little bit, but Wednesday was always our big snatch day. And then I took Thursday and Friday and combined it. So instead of having an explosive day, strength day, explosive day, strength day, we went with a combined program where Monday was was light snatches, uh, light cleans, uh, heavy bench, heavy squat, and then some auxiliary work. Tuesday, I mean, Wednesday was always, we started every Wednesday with snatches. Then we did a unilateral exercise. Uh, box step-ups were, I thought, real, really good, and that was a Coach Hatch exercise. 
We got really good at box step ups. We had, I mean, we had guys that did step ups with 140 kilos for a set of three on an 18 inch box. Um, we had one guy, uh, Raheem Alim, a defensive end for us, did 150 kilos for three reps on an 18 inch box. You better make sure you got great boxes when you do that. And then we did a, uh, we did a single arm bench press day that was always big for us. And then we went to heavy clean pulls because that was one thing that I never took out of the program. Uh, and, you know, a lot of people thought, uh, think that clean pulls help you do power cleans, and they do. But they're also a tremendous lower body and total body strength and power exercise. So we did a lot of clean pulls. We did a lot of glued ham raises on Wednesday. So Wednesday, because, and here was my thoughts, everybody power cleans, everybody benches, everybody squats. And Monday and Friday were our big days for that. And um, I always felt like as a strength coach, Wednesday was the day that separated us from the competition because of the snatches, the heavy clean pulls, the heavy RDLs, the heavy glued ham raises, and some of the other stuff that we did. And I still feel like that those exercises for collegiate football players, snatch, heavy pulls from the floor. We do deadlifts now. We do clean pulls and deadlifts now. That's another change that I made. But I still think that those are some of the things that help us still to this day be, you know, put the type of product that we do on the field. So, again, going, talking about this program behind me. Uh, so I get my first chance to go out to USC with Chris Carlisle. This is in 2001. Um, he approaches me. You know, I was born and raised in Tennessee. And he says, I got the job at USC. I want you to go. And, it, and I was like, where is that located? He's like, it's, all, it's in Los Angeles. I was like, oh, wow. I was like, here we go. And uh, so we go out to Tennessee. Of course, Chris has this blueprint that we had done at Tennessee. And uh, Chris was very, very intrigued with speed and movement and plyo. And uh, so he, was, he got his chance to run his own program. And uh, I was the one that really knew how to put, I guess, the sets, reps, percentages, and all the things into this. We have called it, I think it's Power 5.0. Back in, it was a computer program that would spit things out for you. And I swear, I think he hired me because I knew how to do that, right, and he didn't. And, uh, but uh, we go out to L.A., and we sit down to put this in, and he just hands me the blueprint, but he says, I want to cut out a lot of this volume because I need the time on the front end to work speed, change the direction, and apply metrics. He goes, I think at Tennessee, I think he goes, I think we were lifting too much because I don't think we needed that many sets and reps, that many exercises on each day. So he kind of takes the program and kind of frames what we need and cuts out some of the, some of the, you know, do we need to do six sets of squats? Can we get by with four sets? You know, so we were shaving some volume out of the program to build time for him to implement speed, change direction, all that in the front end. And, and Chris was just, I mean, that, I mean, that was his like focus. We got in the weight room. He was a strength coach. He coached technique. He let me run wild and really work the guys and get strong. But when we came from the training outside, he kind of felt like he'd done his job at the highest level he could. Uh, so, uh, you know, take the program, shave it down, increase our movement, keep, increase our speed. And, uh, you know, second year, third year winning a national title at USC. All right, it was my second ring. So I was, I was – now I was questioning Coach Stuckey. I was like, I don't know. These things come around a little better. All right? maybe, may, maybe, it ain't so, maybe it ain't so hard. But uh, it's just an example, again, of, of, of taking a program and keep, keep modifying it, keep changing the, the recipe and your cook. All right? But as long as you're doing the things well, such as the faith in the process and showing up on time and holding people accountable, it's going to work. And uh, that was my experience. So I take my first head job at University of Idaho, 2004. Well, I learned real quick, the athletes at Idaho weren't as good as the athletes at USC. And again, you talk about, you know, you write this down, you want to make mistakes as a coach. Uh, I made a really big one. And uh, so i would now taken Chris's running program and his speed program that I'd learned under for three years. And I had this lifting program that I had experienced and obviously we've modified. So, you know, we had tailored the sprint program and the, and the conditioning all at USC. So I go to Idaho and just think, we just pick right up there where I left off at USC. 
you know, the amount of speed, tra- the amount of speed reps in training, things like that. I was like, I was just taking the 2004 where we were and bringing it right into there. Well, it wasn't too long that uh, we were pretty blown up as a, as a football team with, with a lot of players in the, in the training room with hamstrings and low backs tight and things like that. So uh, I had to learn real quick that, hey, maybe I, sh- I should have tailored it back down quite a bit myself. And that was a big, big mistake for me. Luckily, I was there a year, and I get to go to Ole Miss 2005. So I kind of learned, I took my lumps as my first head job and did a lot of stupid shit. And uh, I could go in a lot of stories of way more stupid things I did. But uh, we're on time here. But it really prepared me to go to Ole Miss and not do it again. And, uh, and go in there uh, with, hey, better athletes now. And, and take some of the things I learned and start a progression. Start it slow. All right, slow cook this thing and take off with it. Uh, Ole Miss was about a three-year stint. Uh, we come off. We come off there. It was the first time you lose your job. First time you're unemployed. And I think the biggest thing, like Luke said, you you face that, you face that darkness, that fear of like, am I any good? What do I do? Uh, you know, you know, am I a failure? You know, where do you take these things? And you start kind of digging down deep in your side. So that's probably the first time I really started digging deep into like, you know, maybe I should create a, maybe a philosophy to run by on my next job. Maybe I could do some, some things better uh, as a coach. So the first thing I started thinking like, like why did I have faith in this guy? I started going, did my athletes have that faith in me like I did in this guy? So you start going, well, some of them. You know, maybe you missed on a few guys. Maybe you missed on a large percentage of your team. So, so to me, I created a, basically called a four-pillar philosophy, and I know Big Tony uh, can attest to it. It's really everything I live by. So if you want to write something down from my talk, I would give you these four things. Uh, number one, have faith in what you do, okay? The faith of what you do, the faith that I, that I grew to, lo- that, to learn and, and love this guy, okay, that's going to come in time. When you start getting faith from your athletes and they, and they start having faith in you, you're going to build loyalty and you're going to build trust, okay? Now, I don't care if you're a gym owner in here, a strength coach, all right, maybe you own your own business, all right, I promise you better have faith in your service or faith in your product. If you do, okay, you'll get loyalty, you'll get trust, and you'll be probably very successful. The next thing is passion, okay? You have to come to work, uh, come to work every day with passion. Your athletes are going to feed off of it. I know every, every person in here that works with athletes, man, I want my guys to come in and train hard. All right, I want them to come in with passion. All right, well, they're going to mirror how you are, okay? If you come to work like you're dreading it, all right, and you got your hands in your pocket and you're just sitting around like this, all right, they're going to lift that way, okay? They're going to lift exactly how you are. So, uh, again, taking it out of the weight room, business, gym owner, all right, whatever it is, okay, come to work with passion, all right, and good things will happen. You're showing you love it, okay? You're showing you love something. You want to get love back, you have to show it. The third thing is mentor, okay? Mentor people. Teach people how to do something better, okay? Whether it's your coworker, mentor them. Your athlete, mentor them, okay? Your family member, your daughter, son, mentor, teach, okay? Teach them how to, okay? It will, it will pay you back in big dividends, and then the last one was integrity. And that, to me, is your daily, your daily kind of your rules, your concepts, your policies that you have within your organization. Your integrity, your program, to me, is like your house cleaning. Okay? Every day you wake up, you go to your house, you got things you probably do every day. Okay? Maybe you keep the sink, the, the dishes out of the sink. That's something you do every day. Maybe you take the trash out. That's something you do every day. But there's also things you might do maybe once a week. Maybe run the vacuum cleaner, right? Okay, maybe do a load of laundry. You might do the bed sheets every two weeks. Some people maybe once a month. Some people, I don't know, maybe once a year. I don't know. But there's there's things you do in your house cleaning, okay, that are on kind of a schedule. Well, I think the same thing applies in in your business or in your strength department. Okay, there's certain things you'd better be really good doing it daily, okay, because that's the integrity of your program. Okay, that maybe that's how they dress. Talking about how they dress, the right shoes, the right gear. Okay, being on time. How you, how you, 
how you hold them to what on time means needs to be the same from their day zero, the day they walk in, till as they leave as a, as a senior or, or going to the NFL as a junior. It needs to be consistent at all times. If things are wishy-washy, your integrity of your program is starting to drop right in front of your eyes. So you better find ways to build it back up because it's really never staying the same. It's doing this, it's doing this. So that's your job, all right? Your integrity, your program, or your business, or whatever you hold, all right, is your daily responsibility. So those four things, the faith, the passion, the mentor, and the integrity, if you're strong in those four and you have a great balance, all right, you will be successful in whatever you do. Coaching, all right, selling, building equipment, whatever it is, cooking food, running a, a, a food truck, whatever it is. If you do these four things well, you'll be successful. So I designed this, learned from, I took a lot of these concepts of why did I, why did I trust this guy, and it was those four things. Okay, so <clears throat> while, while we were doing our program at Miami, I learned, just like he learned, that, and, and I'd been told this a thousand times, that volume is what fatigues you, not the intensity. And so we had to adapt what we did. So we developed that three-day program at Miami, and then coming to LSU, um, you know, that's the first thing that we did. It had worked for us at Miami, and um, we implemented that three-day program and continued that for a long time. And then, you know, football changes. So as the football changed, the game of football changed, the type of athletes that play the game, and, you know, linebackers got smaller and faster. Uh, we were recruiting safeties now to play linebacker. So we needed to add mass. So we took that three-day program, switched it for, to a four-day program, switched it back. And we trained like that for a while. And uh, so now that program has evolved to, we have, still have the four-day program that we've always done. We have the three-day program that we developed over time based on some of the changes that we saw in the game. So now the way we do it, we'll spend a month or two training on our four-day program. And then as we get close to the season, we'll switch to our three-day program. As we had now, so for, and I know a lot of the football, football strength coaches here will know this. There's not a lot of, we don't run our team nearly as much as we used to because of player-led practices. And uh, you have two hours a week of installation that the coaches are able to do with our players. So the, the, our players will spend an hour in meetings with the coaching staff, and then they do installations. There's a practice script, and then the players go out and practice. I mean, if, and if you didn't know that there were no coaches out there, you, you would think that, you know, we were practicing to get ready to play Alabama. And so what we do as strength and conditioning coaches has changed as the game has evolved, and that's something that you have to do. But – he talked about the four pillars, and I want to close it by going over a couple of key points. Number one, in this business and any business that you do, you have to set goals. It's extremely important. You got to learn to listen. Listen to your boss, listen to your spouse, listen to your athletes, and pay attention because there's something to be learned in everything that you do. You got to work hard. And when you have guys like him that are committed, that are committed to do anything that it takes to win, you're always going to be successful. But not everybody's like that. And you have to listen, pay attention, learn, motivate, communicate to get the most out of those guys. So the thing that I learned most from the head football coach that I worked for early on in my career, he would say, not everybody loves it as much as you do. And he was, he was true. He, he, he was right. And so it's our job as coaches to listen, pay attention, learn, communicate, and motivate the young women and young men that we train on a daily basis. So I got two quick stories to close my, my part, and, and, and two was this, just some really, I guess, full circle moments uh, regarding, regarding coach of how I kind of used – Use this. In 2017, he invited me to come down to LSU to do a staff professional ve development day. So again, I'm like, wait a minute. Like, why are you calling me to bring down to work with your staff? Like, he was like, scared. Yeah. 
<laughs> so he's like, he's no, like, I, want you, I want you to come down. And I want you to do an A to Z, spend all day with him. And I said, what do you want me to talk on? He goes, anything you want. So uh, we, it, was, it was really unique. I was really excited. I fly, I fly in. I go to his house that night. I actually had a massive cold. I, I, again, I think I was before coronavirus. But yeah. like, I, was, I was like hurting, sitting there trying to talk. He's like, you're sick, aren't you? I'm like, I don't know. I got, I got a sinus infection. I mean, I was, eyes were watering. And I had to go present the next day to his staff. And he's like, let me get you some, uh, you know, Benadryl and all this stuff. So I go to the hotel, go to bed. Next day I wake up, I feel a little better. I sounded like freaking Barry White. My voice was like, Ugh. you know, like to me, I sounded sick. To everybody else, I was like, this guy's got a really deep voice. I'm like, nah, this is not my normal voice. But we go on the floor and we do, I mean, we talk about barbell progressions and, and clean technique, press technique, back work, auxiliary work. Uh, we take lunch break. We finish on the floor, we come inside, we get on the board, we start talking sets, reps, percentages, things that I've seen work, things that, that are, are fun, things that you can try. And uh, the, we took a you know, bathroom break, water break, and then the last part, I came in and I actually talked about the four pillars with his staff. And his staff was, his eyes were this big, you know, and they're writing down all these things, you know, all these things, all these things. And uh, they were like, this is great. This is great. And it was funny. I said, you guys realize, like, like I learned these four qu traits from your boss. And they're all like, holy shoot. I mean, they're, li they're getting to work for a guy that is very powerful in those four things, the faith, the, pa the passion, the integrity, and the mentor. Uh, and it, it was really neat for them to, someone's putting it, telling them these things, and they realize, like, I learned it from the guy they're working for. And it was a, it was a really neat moment. Uh, you, see, see, you see kind of the aha go off in their brains. And, and the last one was um, they win the championship in 2019. So we have our first off-season meeting at SC in 2020. This is in January. And, uh, you know, they just won it all. You know, considered best football team of all time. You know, uh, best quarterback of all time. Uh, you know, they ran the whole thing undefeated. Uh, you know, they, they just probably were at the White House visiting the president. I mean, it was LSU, it was all over the news. LSU, best team of all time. So I had a, on the team meeting board, or the team meeting room, I had a picture back from, I think, 96, 95, and I used to have hair back then, probably kind of like, maybe like yours at the time, okay? Um, but I was catching a clean, and I think I maybe was in this position, and there's a picture of Tommy in the background with his clipboard, just coaching, and and I didn't mention who he was, and the players were like, you know, coach, is that you? And I'm like, yeah, that was, you know, twenty something years ago. Yeah, that's me, and uh, and I said, well, what I want you guys to learn is, I started talking about those 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 things, and I talked about the faith. I had full faith in this guy. You see this in this picture, right? And they're all, you know, they're kind of concerned. What, what, where's this point? Where's he going? And uh, I said, I learned that day. I became a student. I said, you know, the saying, the stu when the student is ready, the teacher will appear, okay? You know, Tommy was my teacher, and I learned to be the student, okay? That's what made us successful. I wanted his knowledge. I wanted to take what he told me and apply it to the best of my ability. And I was trying to make the point. I was like, I was ready to become great, and I utilized the resource to do it. And I was, I was challenging our football team all 103 or five sitting in the room, he's like, you know, if you will learn this concept with me and the staff in this room, how powerful can we be if you're ready to take us on, see us as your teacher, all right, and apply what we're giving you and take it, all right, and take it and work the process. And they were all scratching their head, okay, cool, this is great. And uh, I said, I'm going to leave you with this. Said, the guy in the picture is LSU's strength coach. And their eyes got real big because they realized they just won the national title. They just won it all. All of a sudden, all right, I got in my notes here, I appeared very knowledgeable all of a sudden in front of my team. But I used a way to connect with them. All right, I used a way to show them how I became a champion. All right, they can do the same. But putting a stamp with a team that just dominated the year like no other, all right, they thought I was a little smarter all of a sudden, right? And they listened a little bit more and they leaned in a little bit more. So 
Thank you very much, guys. We really appreciate it.